All right, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Uh, this sermon is a reminder of some of the characteristics uh, we should strive to have as Christians. Sometimes we are focused, so busy on life, so busy in troubles, you know, in, in conflict, uh, so busy with, you know, trying to figure out doctrine that we forget that there are just some basic things we need to do as Christians and some characteristics we have to try and exude. And a good place to start is we're going to look at the nine fruit of the Spirit. So obviously as we read through uh, Galatians 5, you can see here the dual nature you know, that we have to contend with once we are saved. And we must decide to walk in one or the other. Galatians 5, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we, you know, our soul, you think about it, our mind, we have to decide, are we going to walk in the Spirit or the flesh? And this is why when somebody's not born again, they don't have a quickened spirit or a spirit that's alive, all they do is sin. But once you're saved, you now have the two natures. You have the flesh and the spirit warring against one another, and you have to decide what you're going to walk in. And what you have to realize about the flesh and the spirit is walking in the flesh is automatic, but walking in the spirit isn't. Right? You have to purpose in your heart to walk in the spirit, and you're on a constant battle against the flesh. And you know what, guys? If you do not walk in the spirit, you know what you're going to do? You're going to walk in the flesh. Because one is automatic and one isn't. That's why the Bible commands us, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh thereof. Right? Because why? Because if you don't walk in the Spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we're looking at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. So what does that mean? This is saying that there is no law forbidding these things. So you can do these as much as you want. You know, we do a lot of things as much as we want. This is what I want you guys to do as much as you want. Let's shift our focus. You know, these, have at it. You know, just do them as much as you want. And if you do that, hey, you'll be uh, on a good path to spiritual growth. Now, what I want, what, before I get into each of these, because I just want to talk a little bit about each of these and show you some scriptures, what's a, what's a good way to memorize the nine fruits of the Spirit? You can see here, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I'll just give you like what I'm thinking about when I run back the fruit of the Spirit in my head, how I remember these nine, and this, this might help you, right? So what I do is I group them into three. So you can see there's three, uh, there's nine, so I group them into three. And I have kind of ways that I remember what is in each group of three, right? So first one is love, joy, peace. So the first group, it's first, they're the shortest words, right? They're all for one syllable. And one way I was always taught, well, I was taught to memorize these, and I thought it was pretty good, is when we go soul winning, right? Love, joy, peace. You go with love, you share with joy, you leave in peace. Love, joy, peace. Right? So that's the first three, right? First group of three. Then you've got a second group of three. And you've got long suffering. Right? So that's number four, because the second group is all the long words. Right? Long suffering, gentleness, goodness. So you got two, the two that start with G. How do I remember which one goes first? Well, they're in alphabetical order. Right? So that's how I remember it. Long suffering, second group is all the long words. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness. Now the second, last three, I just kind of have to remember. They're in alphabetical order, but I know the last group always starts with faith. And then you have the ones that nobody knows what they are, meekness and temperance, right? So that's, why, that's how I remember the three groups. Short, love, joy, peace. Go with love, share with joy, leave in peace. Got the three long ones and the GGs are in alphabetic order. The last one ends in faith. And then it's the two like, ones that people are not so sure about. Right? Faith, meekness, temperance. But you'll, be, you'll know what they mean today, right? Because we'll talk about them in here. So that's how I memorize these. But as I go through the fruit of the Spirit. What I want you guys to reflect on today as I talk about these different fruit of the Spirit, I want, to, uh, I want you to ask yourself the question, you know, how much are you seeing this fruit in your life? You know, and what can you do to see more of it? Right, so I don't want you to walk away from this sermon just thinking, oh, that was an interesting sermon about the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to reflect and think, do I have this fruit in my life? How could I have more of this fruit? fruit in my life. And we're going to talk about what they are and just some practical examples. And obviously, as you reflect on them, 
you can think of your own examples about how you can have more of this fruit in the Spirit. Because this is how you know that you're walking in the Spirit. How do you know whether you're walking in the Spirit? Well, if you have more fruit of the Spirit in your life, that's how you know whether you're walking in the Spirit. Right? It's not necessarily telling you whether or not you're saved. Right? Because saved people sometimes walk in the flesh and that's all they do. Right? That doesn't mean they're not saved. But if you want to know, hey, am I walking in a way that's pleasing to God? Well, here are nine ways you can know whether you're walking in a way that's pleasing to God. So we'll talk about them this morning. All right, number one is love. So I'll try and touch on these each quite quickly. Number one is love. Now this one, everyone knows about what love is, but it's always good to get rid of some misconceptions, right? But 2 Peter 1, love, or as the Bible uses the word as well, charity, is the ultimate goal of the Christian life, right? 2 Peter 1, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. See, often knowledge puffeth up, the Bible says, but charity edifies. But you can see knowledge is quite low in the steps in your spiritual growth, right? You get diligence, so you add some good things to do, right, some virtue, and then you start learning some things, right? So notice, you start doing things before you know everything. But look, as you go on, verse 6, to knowledge, temperance, that's another fruit of the Spirit, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So you see how as you grow in the Christian life, the ultimate goal is love, is charity. And the one thing we want to just remind ourselves of this morning is love is not just, you know, it's not just a feeling. It's not just words. Right? And, and we love in a way that is according to the Bible. Right? Today, you have everyone redefining love. You, know, right? you have the homosexual agenda and the transgender agenda saying love is love. They love to use that word. Right? But what does it mean? People use that word differently. Right? We need to make sure in our own life, as we, as we think of love, we think of love in the way God thinks of love. Right? We need to define love the way God defines love, not as the way the world defines love. I mean, you want to hear a sermon on that? I preached a sermon not long ago called The Truth About Love. It's actually the last sermon that's up there because I, I, I'm falling behind on posting the sermon. So like, the last month of sermons not been up there. So the last sermon that I posted on YouTube, that one was about love. So easy to find that one. It's the last one that's on there. First John 4, 7. Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You see how God is love? You can't love God and have nothing to do with God in the way you're loving. You know what I mean? Like some people, like, they, they love people so much, so they have something for them on Sunday and they skip church, right? And then it's like, no, you got to be at church, right? So... If you're going to love God, right, we've got to love God in a way that is according to God's word, right? So, in this was manifested, let's read from verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. See, we love our children, right? We will do what's right by our children. You know, it's unfortunate. Like, we know people in our lives where, you know, where they have, they say, well, when we get children, we're going to do the right things for God. And you think, like, well, if you loved your children, you would do what's right by them, right? So we need to make sure that love is defined as the Bible defines love because ultimately, this is love, the Bible says, that we walk after his commandments. Now, some misconceptions that we want, right? Misconceptions about love, like I said. Love is not just words. Or it's not just feeling. So this is what the world wants you to think about love. Is oh, you just have a strong desire for something, some strong desire for somebody. Oh, I just love them so much. And yet, there's no commitment. There's no doing what's right by them. You see this often, uh, you know, with with uh, couples that are not married, right? You know, they end up fornicating, but do they actually love somebody, right? And this is why ladies, ladies that are single, you need to make sure, hey, if somebody really loves you, they're not going to take advantage of you and vice versa. That's always what happens, right? That happens a lot with uh, 
couples that are not married and they're dating, right? So, it's not just a feeling. It's not just words, right? We need to love indeed. Look at what it says here in 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see there, when we, when we talk about loving God, it's always linked with loving the brethren. It's loving the children of God. So you can't love God and not love the children of God. So you say, like, I love God, but you can't stand being with people at church. Do you really love God? Because if you loved God, you'd love the people at church as well. Right? They may not always deserve your love. Right? Some people, you know, they don't always get along, but that doesn't mean you can't love them. Right? So this is where you can apply the principles of loving your enemies, loving, uh, turning the other cheek. Right? So we love. love doesn't always mean it gets reciprocated. And you know who can relate to that? Jesus. Because right? Jesus loves you, right? but we don't always reciprocate, do we? We don't always do what's right by Him. And yet, He loves us anyway. Right? So love is not just a feeling. Right? It's, it's action. It's deeds. We love in deed and in truth according to God's Word. So let's think about some application. How do we love? Well, loving is when we put others before ourselves. Philippians 2.1 If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, of any comfort of love, and every, any fellowship of the Spirit, of any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So how can we apply love? Well, it's when we think about others before ourselves, right? Um, you know, one way you can always remember this, when we, when we look about love and joy, you know, we, lo we serve with joy, don't we? So what is joy? Joy stands for Jesus first, others second, and then you. Right? So this is how we love. We want to love by we seem other better than themselves, better than ourselves. So, you want to put, how do you do that? Well, it's when you put the will of others before yourself. So, if we want to love God, how do we love God? It's when we put God's will above our own will. Yeah, maybe we want to do something on Sunday morning, but when you love God, you put God's will before your will, right? That's why you're in church, right? Because you're loving God. Right? You love God, you're keeping His word, you're gathering with God's people. So, you might be tired, but right? you've got to read your Bible. Right? See, this is where you love God. You put God above your own will. Right? So things like that. That's how you put God. So when it, you can do the same with others. You know, in a marriage or any sort of relationship. How do you love the other person? What's well, when you put their will above yours. You know, where do you want to eat? What's going to make you happy? And if people have that serving others mindset, this is where relationships, not just marriages, but relationships, friendships, any sort of relationship, flourishes, right? When one person, like Abraham, you think of Abraham and Lot, remember when they had a bit of contention? And he said, hey, well, we've got to give ourselves some space. What did he do? He said, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. He's, he gives, he's, he's giving, he's sort of letting somebody else's will go before his, right? So that's how we can love. So how can you apply that in your life? Second one, joy, joy, right? Let's go to Philippians 4.1, joy. Now, we know what joy is, but let's uh, talk about a few things about joy. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodias and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Now we know that even in Philippians, Paul talks about hard times, right? Trials and tribulations. 
So what is the difference between joy and what people, I guess, would use the word, they're happy, right? So joy is different, right? Joy is like an eternal happiness, right? Where you can be happy in good times, but you can also be happy in bad times. Because it's not just based on your existing current circumstances, right? Joy is something that is based on something that's eternal, right? And that's why you can have joy even when your current circumstances may change. Your eternal circumstances do not change. This is why Paul here, right? He's saying here, see how he's gotten people saved? And he's saying to them, you know, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, look at this, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. So you see how his happiness is not based, or his, his feeling, or his joy is not based on merely his circumstances. Because if he did, you know where he was? He was in jail, right? He's persecuted, things like this. But he can look at people are saying he knows they're going to be in heaven and walking with the Lord. That's why he can be joyful, because it's not based on just his circumstances, right? So it's something that is true, something that's based on eternity. Now, a misconception when it comes to joy, you know, because the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So you see, notice how no matter what your circumstances are, we should have joy. Now, people have a misconception, and they think like, well, therefore, Christians should just be happy all the time. You know, it's like that song, I'm happy all the time, <laughs> you know. But that's just not the case, right? Does that mean you're not allowed to have highs and lows and struggles and you know things to make you sorrowful but you know but it's it's having the perspective that even though you're going through those things you know you have an eternal perspective so it's not that you're going to be just happy all the time you know what i mean like ned flanders tried to be in the simpsons right and you we all know how that ended if you watch simpsons we well, kind of cracked so that's not biblical christianity right so Look at what the Bible says in John 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Do you see how it's not always going to be easy life? But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, did Jesus say, be of good cheer? I'm not going to let you go through tribulation? No. He said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. We eventually are going to win. You don't have to lose your joy even though you may have sorrow for a temporary season. Right? So Christians aren't necessarily happy all the time, but we should be joyful all the time. Right? We should have joy, and that doesn't mean necessarily we're always going to feel good. Right? So joy. Joy in having things of eternity. Matthew 6, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So a lot of people derive their joy from physical, material wealth. You know, you get new gadgets, you get that new house, you finally saved up for that car you wanted or that bike you wanted, and you get a lot of happiness, right? Is this what you should be basing your joy on? Of course not. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Very good verse to think about when you think about material possessions. Everything you can see in the physical, that's all temporary. Because, you know, the only things that are eternal are the things that are not seen, right? The souls of men and the works you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go on to number three. So it's love, joy, peace. What is peace? Peace, according to the Bible, is absence of conflict through unity. Absence of conflict through unity. It's not just the absence of conflict, right? Because anyone can just have the absence of conflict by just cutting everyone off in your life and just leaving everyone, right? Absence of conflict, problem solved, right? No, that's not the sort of peace God wants. God wants peace through unity, where people can come together and talk and work things out and have peace where you are, may not always agree with one another, but you can understand one another. You can get on the same page, at least agree to disagree, but it's peace through unity. 
James 3.13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, a conversation in the King James Bible is like your lifestyle, right? Not necessarily when we think about conversation. His works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but, if, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So you see how the wisdom from above that causes strife and contention Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, right? So this is how God wants us to live. This is the wisdom that he wants us to have. Is first pure, then peaceable. So you see how we have peace through unity, right? We have peace through actually being pure first, right? Not just peace at all costs gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So peace is the absence of conflict through unity, right? And these are just my definitions for you guys, how I'm describing them to you. But some misconceptions, some misconceptions just because you have trouble and division in your life doesn't necessarily mean you're not being peaceful. Right? So you want to strive for peace through unity. But sometimes peace is not possible. Right? And just because there is sometimes contention and division in your life, that doesn't always mean you're not a peaceful person. Now look at what it says here in Psalm 120 verse 7. I am for peace, but when I speak... They are for war. Right, so even though you may want to be at peace with somebody, they don't want to be at peace. And this is why, not always when there is contention going on, are you necessarily the one that is not being peaceful, right? So that's a misconception. You know, it's, you know, it's always going to be peaceful. No, because sometimes when you speak, they are for war. Now, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. This is often a verse we read at Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You often have people say to you, oh, Jesus is the Son of God, how can he be God as well? Well, you explain that to me. He's the Son that's given, and he's the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. All right, so I guess, you know, there, there must be a way that works if God is telling us that how it works, but often people will say, well, was Jesus God? Or is Jesus the Son of God? And here's how it works. He's both. Right? <laughs> He's just both. So Jesus here, the Prince of Peace. You think like, if anyone knows how to be peaceful, it's Jesus. But look at what he said when he came. Luke 12. Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Because sometimes when you speak, you're for peace, but they are for war. Right? So it's not that you're trying to cause strife and contention, but Jesus made it very clear that when people live for him and they preach him, there's going to be trouble even within the family. Right? This is saying within the household. How much more trouble with the world and colleagues and friends and whatnot. So it's not that we want to have trouble with everyone. You know, we want to be at peace. We want to be able to reach them. We want to love them. But sometimes it's not possible. So don't get discouraged if sometimes when you start living for the Lord, start realizing people don't enjoy your company as much as they used to, <laughs> right? That's, that's normal, right? That's expected. That's not what we want, but that sometimes is what happens, right? Philippians 4. Philippians 4. It says here, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right? So we talked a little bit about peace with our fellow man, and we'll touch on that a bit more. So when we think about peace, 
the fruit of the Holy Spirit, peace. It's not just you know, peace with our fellow man, but it's also peace within yourself as well. Sometimes people are very anxious. People today are very fearful. They struggle with anxiety, and we, we can be at peace. How, how do we overcome sometimes this anxiety in our lives? Well, like Jesus said, you know, in the world you have tribulation. That's not only physical tribulation, but you know, also just trouble in your life. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So how do, we, how do we help ourselves and encourage ourselves if we're having anxiety and nervousness, fear in the world, knowing that ultimately Jesus is going to win and God knows what is going on? This is why when it talks about here, about the peace of God that passes all understanding, how? Because we commit things to God. See, there, the, the reality of life, guys, is there are just things in our life that we cannot control. As much as you try and control everything, some people more than others, you know, bit of a, like a, like they say me, they call me a control freak sometimes. I don't think I'm that controlling, but um, some people say I am. But you, know, you try and be organized and control all your circumstances, but ultimately you can't control everything. And the things you can't control, this is where prayer comes in. Because you're saying to God, I'm leaving it to you. So with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Because we're not just praying to just a false God. We're not praying to a statue that we made in our own image. We are praying to the true and living God that created all things. You can have some peace that when you pray to Him, according to His will, right, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He hears you, right? So you don't need to worry anymore. You just need to do what you can in your circumstances and then let, 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 let the... The, the left, what's left, you leave to God. So not only peace with your fellow man, but peace within yourself as you commit things to God and as you commit things to God and trust God with the things you can't control, you will experience the fruit of the Spirit of peace, right? That peace in your life because you're not so careful, right? See, when it says careful for nothing, here in the King James Bible, it's talking about being full of worry, right? full of care, not that you are doing things diligently. Right? When we think about being careful, we think about being diligent. Right? That's what the Bible talks about, being diligent. Careful means you're worried. You know, you're very anxious about things. Okay? So not only care, uh, peace within ourselves, but peace with our fellow man. The Bible gives us instruction on how to resolve a conflict. And the trouble is, even though these steps are very clear, people don't follow them. So I'm just going to keep reading them again. I go over these every now and then, but Matthew 18, 15. If you have a conflict with somebody, how do you go about resolving it? Verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. A few important things here. If thy brother trespass against thee, you go to them. That's not how most people operate. Most people, they will think, well, they wronged me. Why should I go to them? Why should you go to them? Because you're commanded to go to them. That's how it works. Because chances are, if they're wronging you, do you think they care how you feel? <laughs> That's generally the case, right? They're wronging you. And generally, if you get bitter, it's only going to destroy you. So this is why when somebody wrongs you, when somebody does something wrong, if you want it, right, your responsibility is to go and raise it with them and say, look, you know, did this, you know, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it, or, you know, you shouldn't have done this, I'm just letting you know. But you have to try and work it out between thee and him alone. Thee and him alone. You have a problem with somebody. Right? This is not somebody does me dirty and then I tell everyone but thee and him alone. Right? <laughs> because that's what happens often, more often than not. And you see, it's easy to do that because it's the flesh. Spirit, this is how you deal with it. The person that wrongs you, you need to confront them. Right? Now, let's say they don't hear you, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Right, so now you have a conversation with more people present right, to 
either confront this person. This is where the idea of like that inquisition comes. Where people are like, is this an inquisition where people come and there's multiple people to talk there? This is why, right? Because if a person will not write, they're wrong, right? You can escalate and have more people get involved. And ultimately, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now, this doesn't mean you then go individually and go tell everybody in church, right? This means you raise it with church leadership, right? So you'll raise this with me if I'm not already included in this group. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So you see, people that do people dirty in a church and aren't repentant of it, right? Don't get it right. Ultimately, they're not welcome at church, right? So you can't be at church and just have problems with everyone and it's fine, right? Now, obviously, if the person that you've wronged never escalates, it's never going to be dealt with. But if somebody actually has been wronged and they try and resolve it, the person says, no, I haven't done anything wrong. Like, who are you to tell me what to do? Well, you know, that's an attitude. Well, two or three, still having that attitude. Victor's involved, still that attitude. Okay, you're no longer allowed here anymore until you get right. So there, it gets to a point where, you know, it's, it, that's how it escalates. And that's the most the church can do, right? The most the church can do is say, look, I mean, you're not welcome to fellowship with the body here. But all I'm showing you here is, like, you know, problems in a church are very serious, right? But people have to be willing to try and resolve them, right? Obviously, if you have conflict with another person and you don't bring it up with them, it'll never get resolved. But it's something that needs to be resolved. I think I always tell people, you know, sometimes people have conflict with people, they just say, oh, I just... Just won't talk to them anymore. That's not the right way to deal with things, guys. If you have a problem with somebody, you need to deal with it, right? Because you're not loving your brother or sister as you are, right? So that is the escalation process. We're going to have peace with our fellow man. Now we get into the second groups. Long suffering. These are the long ones, right? I'll try and go through these a bit quicker. Long suffering. Long suffering. Now, if you don't know what long suffering means, like I tell the kids, just break it up. When you suffer, long time. <laughs> right? So it's when people do you wrong, you know, and you know, you're going through hard times, but you, you deal with it, right? You don't just get offended and then quit. You don't like go through hard times and give up. Do you know what I mean? Long suffering. There's some hardness there that you have to endure. Second Peter 4. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now I can relate to this one quite well because I think mean, this is to Timothy, right? This is to a preacher where we have to preach the word, we have to teach, we have to reprove, we have to rebuke. You know, this is like telling people what's right, telling them off, rebuke, exhort, try and get them to do what's right, but with all long suffering and doctrine. It's like Paul always says, the more he loves, the less he is loved. Because sometimes the more you love people, the less people like you. <laughs> so sometimes you have to have some long suffering, right? Where people sometimes say nasty things about you, but you keep going, it's long suffering. So sometimes trouble can come internally. Right? You don't want that to make you quit the Christian life. Guys, if you haven't already, you're going to get offended by somebody in this room, I, I, I assure you. Somebody's going to you know, say something the wrong way or say, can't believe they did that. You know, don't let that make you quit the Christian life, right? Just expect it, right? You know people well enough. Unfortunately, ultimately, you sometimes upset people. This is where you've got to think of it as a chance to grow in the Lord, right? When you have conflict amongst people, you don't run from it. You need to deal with it. It's a chance to grow and to grow in the ways and, and, and implement some of the Matthew 18, 16 to 18 stuff. Well, Matthew 16, 18 stuff. So sometimes... You have to suffer with people within. Sometimes it's without as well. So not only will we long suffer within the church, but also externally, right? There's going to be trials and tribulations, and you don't want the trouble in the world to discourage you from doing something for God. I mean, how many times do I hear Christians saying, you know, oh, it's too hard, what's the point? Right? They'll say, like, oh, you know, what's the point of even trying? There's too much against us anyway. Right? With the media and all that's going on. What, are you going to quit? Are you just going to let them have it? I don't think so. We've got to have a bit of long-suffering, right? And fight. Go down fighting. 
It's like when people say about guns in America, you can have my gun when you pry it from my cold, cold dead fingers. Right? We've got to have that sort of mentality when it comes to what's right. It's like you can have it when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. Right? So we'll go down fighting. Outside, also within as well. Right? Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering. Look at this. Forbearing one another in love. Now, if everything... See, people sometimes have this idea. Like, they come to a church and they just think, like, you know, everything's going to be fine. Like, everything's, like, everyone's just great and everything. They don't realize, like, conflict... Ha- now, if you went to a church and everyone's Christian and that just means everyone's just perfect and just going to love you the way Jesus loves you, why do verses like this need to exist? They exist because not everything was perfect in church, right? Not everyone loves the way they should. Not everyone treats everyone the way they should. But this is why being part of a church, not only can you get support and make friends, but it's also a chance to grow with other imperfect people. right? All lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring, striving right, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we're trying to be at peace here, and it's a constant growing struggle, isn't it? So... Long-suffering. Now, misconceptions with long-suffering. Now, just because you're going through trouble, that doesn't mean you're not being righteous. Right? Some people, they have a misconception where they think, well, I'm doing everything right by God. Why is my life so hard? Where did you get that idea from? You didn't get it from the Bible, I can tell you that. You know, maybe you got it from some internet preacher that told you that if you loved God and you were a Christian, then you would be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, that person's not reading their Bible either. You know, because if you read the Bible and you saw through the Bible how the apostles lived, how Jesus lived, would you get the idea that if you're a Christian, everything's just going to be fine? So the Bible says, hey, you know, yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So going through trouble does not mean necessarily that you are not being godly. I mean, think of Job. Job is the ultimate example and the ultimate answer to people saying, well, if there's a loving God, why would he let me go through these things? I'm sure Job asked the exact same question. Right? But we know from Job what the answer is. First Peter 2, For this is thankworthy of a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So he's saying basically here, if you are disciplined or beaten up for the wrong things you do, you know, then what glory is there? There's no glory in that. But if you do it, if you are suffering for doing what's right, then if you take it patiently, that is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Right? So sometimes life is not always easy. Matthew 5, here's an application. Sometimes when you stand up for doing what's right, you're going to be persecuted. Verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Look at the response we should have. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. Right? So one way we suffer long is this is how we can love our enemies like the Bible talks about. Right? Because sometimes we're going to be wronged for doing right, what is right. But it's an opportunity for us to suffer long. Luke 6 verse 35, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So this is not easy to do. 
But you've got to think, every time you have a personal enemy, this is an opportunity to keep this commandment. Right? It's not simple to do, but if we never have any enemies, when can we ever have an opportunity to do this? And sometimes God knows that, and that's why he allows us to go through the things that we go through. Long-suffering. Right, the next one, gentleness. Gentleness. Gentleness is not being harsh in how we deal with people both physically and spiritually. Both physically and spiritually. 1 Thessalonians 2, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So you can see how gentleness is not just being rough or harsh with people, it's just dealing with people in the right way, right? Gentleness in the way God is gentle as well. So we see here Paul talking about how he dealt with the Thessalonians, that he was gentle with them. Now, a misconception here with gentleness is that there's never a time, and we already talked about resolving conflict, that sometimes people think that there is never a time to tell someone off, right? To rebuke them, right? But there are certain times. Obviously, we always speak the truth with love, but there are times where we may not be as gentle with people as we would like. Or gentleness does not mean that you are never willing to tell somebody or confront somebody that they are wrong, right? Never willing to stand up for yourself. So don't think of gentleness as just being a doormat and being walked all over. Gentleness means you just deal with the situation in the right way. Luke 17, verse 3, look here. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So you see here, if he repent, oh, here you go. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. So it's not wrong to tell somebody off. But we do it with love. We do it to, to, to resolve conflict and we're always trying to be gentle but that doesn't mean necessarily not confronting people that are doing things wrong so like i said it doesn't mean it's okay for people to just walk all over you it's okay to stand up for yourself now applications obviously dealing with conflict right dealing with conflict you want to be gentle with how you deal with that but what's some other other applications i want you to think about gentle in how we deal with our children Gentle in how we deal with our children. I know parenting is difficult. I know parenting can really take it out of you. Parenting can really stress you and stretch you to the end, right? But it's not justification to treat your children the wrong way, right? I know we've all done it, but it's a good reminder for us. Colossians 3.21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So you see, like, we don't, we want to deal with our children the right way, right? Because if we don't, like, I don't want to be the cause of my children being discouraged. Do you know what I mean? So the way we deal with our children is very important, right? And we want to be gentle with them, just like Paul dealt with the Thessalonians. So not only dealing with our children, that's one way we can apply the fruit of the Spirit to be gentle, but how we even preach the gospel Sometimes people, you know, they know the truth, they're passionate about the truth, but are you gentle in how you preach the gospel to others and how you share the truth with other people? Are you speaking the truth with love? Sometimes you don't always see Christians sharing the gospel in love. You know, they're getting angry with the person. You know, and they get like, what's the point of being angry? How's that going to win them over? You know, like, they just don't understand. Help them to understand. There's no reason taking things personal. But not everyone preaches the gospel with the right mentality. There's a right way to preach the gospel. There's a wrong way to preach the gospel. Philippians 1.15 Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. Some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. You see, when Christians do not speak the right way, they don't preach the gospel, they make it harder for other people. If you don't preach the gospel the right way and that person kind of gets burned a little bit, the next person that comes along, it's going to be difficult for them too. All right? So you need to think about 
how you deal with people and not just burn a bunch of bridges in your wake, you know what I mean? So that you're not causing more affliction to others and making it more harder for others. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So I think this is very important. You know, even us who go out and preach the gospel out in the neighborhood, it's very important our testimony, right? We want to share, we want to go with love, go, go, go with love, share with joy, and leave in peace. You know, I try not to have leave with people upset at me. You know what I mean? That's, that's my goal. It's not something I try and do. I'm not just out there. I'm not just going to have the attitude of, well, I'm just telling the truth. If they're upset, that's their problem. No. I'm trying to share it in a way, in a gentle way, so they don't get upset with me, right? And those of you who have gone sowing with me, you know my sort of attack when i preaching the gospel at the door. So preaching the gospel, but also not just dealing with unbelievers, preaching the gospel to them, but sometimes people are not gentle, even amongst themselves. They get frustrated with their brothers and sisters in Christ because they don't share their own views and things like that. And then, you know, you try and talk on one doctrine and you disagree, you take it personal, and then you just won't talk to each other anymore, right? It happens all the time. But are you being gentle, not only preaching to unbelievers, but sometimes people, they, you know, with an unbeliever, they like love and they're you know, gentle and they just do everything they can. But then when it comes to their own brothers and sisters in Christ, one hint of like they don't agree and they just write them off. And it's like you're meant to love your brothers and sisters in Christ even more than those in the world. If, if that's how you treat an unbeliever and that's how patient you are with them and willing to explain with them, why are you not that same with your brothers and sisters in Christ? It should be the same, even more so. You know, do good to all men, especially of those of the household of faith. 2 Timothy 2, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So gentle in how we deal with people. Gentleness. All right, next one. Goodness. Goodness. So goodness, obvious, is doing what is right. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So there is a concept of, obviously, good in terms of obeying God's commandments and not. And the Bible says there is none good but one that is God, Jesus said. But here, it says here, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. So how are we able to do good now that we're saved? Well, because we do them by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is doing the right thing both in commandment, but there's also being good in regards to your conviction and your conscience as well. See, not everything in the Bible is outlined for you in black and white. You know, the Bible gives us principles sometimes, and you have to apply those principles and decide, hey, how to best apply these principles so that I am pleasing to God. And this is why there are areas in the Christian life where there's a lot of debate and there's never any resolution, because these are things that are in the areas of conviction. Think about music. Think about your dress standards. Think about your appearance. Think about all those sorts of things. These are areas of conviction. But if you know a good thing to do, that is right, that is better, and you don't do it. That is sin too. So this is what I'm saying. When we talk about goodness, we want to do good, not only just, oh, am I keeping God's commandments, but am I doing what's best as well? Look what the Bible says here in James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? So even though the Bible doesn't command you necessarily, you must be in church once a week, the Bible just tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But if you say, you know what, it's good for me, you know, it's wise, you know, Victor's encouraging it, to be at church, I should be doing that, and you don't, that's sin. So it's not sin necessarily that you're not going to church every week. Some churches meet more than once a week. But if there's something that you know is right to do, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Do you see? So there's that sort of, um, that subjective way of judging, but it's based on our conscience and convictions and different factors. But we're following the principle to get in God's house, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And then following, obviously, the traditions that are passed down to us of meeting once a week on Sunday with the whole pattern of six and one that God said in the, in the Old Testament. Second Thessalonians 3. Second Thessalonians 3 here. It says here, 
So we talked about doing right both in commandment and convictions. But a misconception is in doing good. Sometimes doing something positive for someone isn't always good. So doing good doesn't always mean it's all positive, 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 positive. Because why? Sometimes it's right to rebuke people. We saw there, when your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Well, here's another example. Sometimes the good thing to do is to refrain from helping somebody. For even when we were, with the, we, we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. What's the context here? Lazy people in church mooching off everyone else. Right? These are not people that genuinely need help. These are able-bodied people that can do work themselves and yet they refuse to and they're always asking for charity. Right? This is what it says here. And he would not work, neither should he eat. But we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. What's the disorderly? That they're lazy, right? They won't work. Working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right? So it even gives us the right way in which we are to deal with this. And just giving you an example here that doing good is not always just always helping people at all costs. Because sometimes doing good is refraining from assisting them with something they would like, but you know, even here, it's better that you don't know because they need to be admonished as a brother and they need to be able to provide for themselves if they are able to and they're just being lazy. Other ways we can do good. Matthew 5, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God, which is in, glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So not only can we help others by sometimes refraining from help, but also this is where I get the principle of, hey, we need to be active not only in our lives, in our church, but in our society as well, because we want to be a salt and light in this world. We want to make a difference in our church and in our nation. All right? Let's talk about faith. Faith. Faith is what you believe. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you can see your own faith, you know what you believe, and that is, the Bible says, the substance of things that you hope for, the fact that you know you believe something. And it's the evidence of things not seen, like your salvation. It's the evidence that you have salvation because you have faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, misconceptions with faith. I won't spend too much time on what faith is. But misconceptions, not all faith is good faith. Just because somebody says they have faith, that doesn't mean it's good. That doesn't mean it's right. Because everybody believes something. Well, what do they believe? For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods? their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So you see, you can have faith in a false, false religion. You can have faith, faith in a false God just because you have faith. You may have faith in humanity. You know, and that's why people sometimes when they're trying to inspire people at talks, you know, even at these protests, right? Just have faith. You need faith in humanity. And that all sounds good and well, right? But, you know, obviously they may be talking about having faith in who knows what, right? Having faith in some, you know, special force that they think everyone's tapped into. Um, a lot of people believe that, you know, especially in the health movement. They have this, uh, this idea, this new age mentality, that everyone just taps into this big conglomerate mentality, and that's like, you know, if have faith in yourself, have faith in that. Not all faith is equal, guys. Faith in what? Faith in God's little g 
in a rock, little r, you know, in whom they trusted. So you're going to have a wrong faith. We need faith in the Bible, right? Faith on the truth, faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only that, some misconceptions, but faith, you, know, you need to understand that when the Bible talks about faith, it's just talking about what you believe. Faith doesn't always necessarily equate to salvation. So you don't always see faith in the Bible and just always think that talk is talking about whether or not you're going to heaven or not, whether or not you're saved. Because there is faith to get saved and then there's faith to live right. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's by grace ye are saved through faith. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So you see how we go from faith on Jesus Christ, we're saved, to now faith day by day, walking in his word. Right? These are two different things. You don't get confused. Salvation by grace through faith, but also serving the Lord through faith. Right? Doing works through faith. Right? So, when we talk about salvation is only by faith, we're talking about how to receive grace. Right? We're not talking, we're not saying that's all that faith is, is salvation. So, how do we increase our faith? Two quick applications. One, you read the Bible. You read the Bible. Faith in what? Romans 10. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How can you have faith in God's Word when you don't know God's Word? Right? So you've got to read God's Word. And the more you read it, the more faith you put in it, the more you're going to follow it. Right? So not only we want faith in God's Word, we don't want to have a dead faith that has no works. James 2.19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. See, we don't want to have a dead faith. This is not talking about the Christian is dead. You put your faith on Jesus Christ, you're, you're alive, you're, you're saved. But is your faith alive, is your faith alive or dead? Well, that depends whether you add works to it. If you add works to it, then you're saved. Right? Sorry, if you add works to it, then it's alive. If you don't have works, it's dead. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this passage. This is not saying that people, the devils believe on Jesus Christ. And people say, oh, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you don't have works, you're not saved. No, that's saying the devils believe there is one God. But you know what? You know the Muslims believe there's one God as well? They're not saved. So, you know, this is, not, this is just about them believing something. Great, they believe it, but if you don't have works to it, then the belief is not going to profit anybody else. But this passage is not about salvation, and that's another sermon for another time. Eight, almost there, two more. Meekness, meekness. Now, meekness, people think of humility. Humility and meekness is very good. But one, one way I was always taught to think of meekness is like meekness is not weakness. That's what they'll say. So just like we talked about long-suffering and gentleness, it's not just being a doormat, being walked all over. Just because you're meek, that doesn't mean you're like Ned Flanders and you're just a walkover and just everyone walks and everyone tells you what to do. Meekness is not weakness. People often define meekness as like strength under control. You know what I mean? Like you have strength, you have the ability, but you submit to authority within your life. So it's like at your work, you may be more capable than your boss, maybe, you know, but does that mean you don't know your place, right? Does that mean you don't respect your boss at work? You don't serve your boss at work the way you are expected? You don't show them respect? It's the same in any area of life, right? It's the same in church as well. People may, may, may know more than me. People may be more capable than me, but you know your place, right? There's an authority structure in different areas of life. So it's knowing your place under authority. I mean, look at Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. I mean, if anybody could lift themselves up 
I mean, it's the creator of the universe, right? But he says, look, I am meek and lowly in heart. Because why? Even he, when he took on flesh, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the Bible says. So this is the idea of meekness. I mean, could, could Jesus have just clicked his fingers and then just called down fire from heaven when he was on the... just burnt everyone up? He could have. But you see how it's strength under control. It doesn't mean you don't acknowledge your capabilities, right? It's about how you use them. I mean, Moses is another good example of meekness. The Bible calls him the meekest on all the, on all the face of the earth. Now look here when it says that. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. See, so here's a couple of racists in the Bible, right? Miriam and Aaron, his brother and sister. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? So you see how Moses acknowledged that God was speaking through him, right? That he was appointed as the leader of Israel. But even though he was, I mean, what a meek man he was, even knowing the position he was in and what he was capable of. I mean, he's the one that held the stuff. I mean, think about all the things he did. I mean, that sort of stuff, you know, for a lesser person, probably lift themselves up, you know, and puff them up. But it says here, and the Lord heard it, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So it's no wonder that God lifted him up. I mean, knowing this about Moses, that he was very meek, he was very humble, kind of makes you think that's probably why God lifted him up, knowing this. And if you read the rest of the chapter, you can see how, dealt, how God dealt with this situation with Aaron and Miriam. Right? So, application, like we talked about, submitting to... You no know, work, you know, employees submit to your managers. You know, mem- I guess church members would submit to church authority, church leadership. Children, you know, submitting to your parents. It's one way to be meek. Wives submitting to their husbands. Right, that's something in the Bible too. So wives submit to their husbands. But husbands submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. So just remember, guys, nobody's at the top. Right? Jesus is at the top. Everyone has somebody to submit to. Right? So don't feel so bad if you've got to submit to somebody. Everybody has a bigger boss because ultimately God is at the top. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So one thing I want you to note from this verse is not only are we commanded to, com- to submit to the authorities in our life, right? the higher power, right? so there's a structure, there's a hierarchy of authority, and you follow that authority. But it's saying here, if you do it with the right attitude and mindset, it is actually better for you. Right? So you may sometimes think, ah, oh, my boss doesn't know what he's talking about, Victor doesn't know what he's talking about, you just resist and resist and resist. You know, you will actually be better off in your life if, when it is appropriate, right, it's according to God's word, that you submit to the authority in your life. Maybe they're doing some, asking you to do something that you don't like to do. But if you just do it, look at what the Bible says, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So you know what? It's going to be better for you overall if you know your place in different areas of life and you submit to authority, it'll be more profitable for you. That's what that verse is saying. All right, verse nine, uh, last one, temperance. Temperance. Now, what is temperance? Temperance is discipline, self-control, consistency. That's what temperance is, when you're temperate. Think about when you temper something. You know, when you temper steel, it's like putting it under heat and putting it, again, you know, they temper steel, they harden it right, through going through the struggle and the molding, right, which is why we're talking about molding, a masterpiece which is sung in the song, temperate. So it's not only is it going through hard times, right, I mean consistent and patient, but it's also the self-control and the discipline. Look at what Paul says about being temperate in 1 Corinthians 9. What are you, and, and just note how he likens it. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So he likening the Christian life like a competition, right? So run that ye may obtain. Run the Christian life so that you will win. 
Oftentimes, people are comfortable in the Christian life with just a participation award. You know, I'll just get my sticker for finishing the race. You know, well done. Hey, not everyone is going to be at the front. Not everyone's going to be at the top. But what should your attitude be when that gun goes off? You want to win, right? And it's like in the Christian life. You want to win. Yeah, you may not be better than everyone else. You may not, you know, when you compare yourself with others, you may not think you're going to, like, finish first or whatnot. But this is the great thing about the spiritual life is that we're not all running the race from the same start line, you know? So you want to run your race as though you will win, you obtain that prize. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know, when I think of this verse here, Every man that striveth for the mastery. It's saying every man that strives to become a master in what they do, an expert in what they do, is temperate. They're disciplined. And, you know, like, sort of recently, I've been following more, like, the UFC, right? And the fighting, and it's just, like, getting into that. And then you hear the backstories about the sacrifice and the training that they do. Everyone sees the glory, you know? It must be nice and having all that and, the, and winning the fight. But it's like you read about the struggle and like the training and every day and it's like the sacrifices they've given up. And, you, and it makes me think of this verse and it's like, man, that's what he's talking about, temperate. You know, I don't think they're necessarily having fun all day doing that grind and a lot of athletes don't make it. You know, and the Christian life can be the same. You know, you want to be great in the Christian life. It's not always going to be easy, Right? So being temperate doesn't mean you're not passionate. Doesn't mean you never get angry. These are some misconceptions. Temperate doesn't just mean you're always monotone. All right? 2 Corinthians 9. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago. And look at this. And your zeal hath provoked very many. You see, it's a good thing to be passionate in the Christian life. Temperate doesn't mean that you're not passionate about things. Temperate doesn't mean you never get angry at anything. Look at Ephesians 4. Be angry and sin not. Let not your sun go down upon your right. Neither give place to the devil. Look, Mark 3. Here's an example of when Jesus got angry. Some people think being angry is not a Christian attribute, but it's being angry at the right things. It's being angry and not sinning. Right? You can be angry at things and not be sin sinning. Mark 3, and he saith unto them, this is when somebody who had, had needed healing came to Jesus and they got angry at him because he healed him on the Sabbath day. He said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Verse 5, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Right? So it's not necessarily a sin to be angry. There is sometimes a time to be angry at things. So just a couple of applications quickly on temperance. You know, no one becomes a master of anything easily, right? Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. So if you think anything worth doing is going to be fun all the time, then you're kidding yourself. Anything that is of great value, that's worth doing, if you're going to get good at it, it's not always going to be fun. There's going to be a grind aspect to it. Am I right? So if work isn't like that, what makes you think marriage is like that? What makes you think Christianity is like that? You know, people often live the Christian life and they start thinking, oh, this isn't as interesting anymore. This isn't as fun anymore. Well, it's because there comes a point in time where it requires work. You know what I mean? And just like here, if every man that strives for the master, you've got to go through some grind. 
you've got to endure some hardness. It's the same thing in the Christian life. Look at what it says here in 2 Timothy 2, 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the thing is, you know what's funny? The more you actually grind in the Christian life, and you actually accomplish in the Christian life, the more you're going to enjoy it too. It's a bit of, it's a bit of both. You know, you, you find it may not always be fun. It may not always be pleasurable. But you know what? It's very fulfilling. Knowing that you spend time investing into the eternity. All right, so in conclusion, sorry, I know it's a bit of a long one, but hopefully it helps you guys. Remember how to remember it. Love, joy, peace, the short ones. Go with love, share with joy, leave in peace. The long ones, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and then faith, and then the ones that aren't so familiar to people, meekness and temperance. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So please reflect on these things. How much are you seeing this fruit in your life? And what could you be doing to have more of this fruit bear in your life? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for teaching us characteristics we ought to have as a believer. Lord, we're not perfect. We come short all the time. But Lord, like you said through your servant Paul, Help us to run that we may obtain. Help us to strive for the mastery and be temperate in all things. Mold us, Lord. We want to be a masterpiece for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.